welcome back to Wild Talk. We are joined still by Byron Wolf from Wolf Hunt Adventures. Uh, just before the break, we were ribbing Steve a little bit um, on some of his outfits through the holidays. But Byron, Steve's actually been up and hunted with you quite a few times, and I've seen some pictures of some pretty big wolves in his hands. Just how big are these wolves that you guys are taking up there? The biggest wolf we've ever killed is 130 pounds, um, and it it was a giant. Steve's, I think Steve's biggest wolf was 117. If that num that number seemed to stick in my head, which is that's a hell of a wolf. There is there is no such thing as a 200 pound wolf, and I've I've told millions of people if you can show me a 200 pound wolf on a scale i'll give you a free wolf hunt and i've never have to get had to give one away yet so so what you're trying to tell us is there's no such thing as a 140 pound coyote <laughs> no that doesn't exist either <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny so byron let's uh you know well, obviously without giving out too many of your uh, too many of your secrets and your tips what uh, what are a couple of tips you would like to throw out to the viewers to help them if they're going to go on a on a self baited wolf hunt? If you're going to go and do your own wolf hunt, you're going to put in a lot of effort. Don't ex expect to be successful right away. It's going to take time. It may happen the first time you go and sit it. You got really lucky, but never sit a bait with the wrong wind because they will not come in. I find mm -hmm. the further away from the bait you are the better chance you got. My magic number is 250 yards. Um, that's a long shot for a lot of people. We probably average 50% misses at that distance. Um, so know your, know your rifle, know your, know how to shoot all that good stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I like, I like a good open area, uh, beaver ponds, uh, field edges. Uh, I'll, I'll, I like to put my blind in the field and the bait on the edge or on the edge of a mm -hmm. beaver pond and across on the other side the bait so they got cover coming in um but i find wolves love beaver ponds and little creek drainages and stuff like that that's very interesting i've i've set up um on wolves we've been able to uh, have a lot of success getting them relatively close but they've always seemed to hang up uh like we found fresh kills when i've been out hunting um or areas where we can see they're cruising the logging roads We've been able to pull them in close. We can hear them howling, but we're hunting steep timbered area. And we've just never been able to get them to close those, that last little bit of a difference. And it's distance, I should say. And it just seems like they're very, for how aggressive you think a wolf would be, they're actually very apprehensive as well. They don't like to get too close without getting your wind. You know, uh, if, if they can get in behind you, uh, they'll do it every time. I'm going to assume being the expert, you've got an answer to this one. But, you know, you see the uh, general populace and, and the, the rhetoric that comes out that wolves don't kill indiscriminately and they eat everything that they kill. True or false? They, they are opportunists. They will kill what's in front of them when it's in front of them, given the chance. Now, if they've just devoured a fresh moose and there's another one right in front of them, are they going to chase it down? Probably not. We've all overeaten that Thanksgiving dinner and you got six pounds of turkey and you, you're not going to go for a run. But say they're, they're chasing a herd of deer and two of them take down one, the rest of the pack aren't going to turn around and go back. They're going to kill as many out of that herd as they can. I've seen it in, in a night where there's, there's three deer killed in, in a mile stretch. So um, the first two cleaned right up and the, the third one just, just barely touched. Well, Byron, um, it is a hot topic. Some people aren't sure where they sit on wolf hunting, but with the experience you've had in your area, what are some things you can say to those fence sitters that might lean them more towards getting in the field and getting after those wolves? Well, you get a healthier ungulate population and the wolves will be healthier. We touched on that earlier with uh, the mange and the shoulder mites. And you've seen that for yourself personally in the area since you've been hunting? hundred percent. Yeah. Well, Byron, thanks for, thanks for doing your part of uh, making uh, the herds more healthy and the, uh, the packs more healthy as well. So uh, if anybody wants to go on a wolf hunt with you, uh, we're getting ready to close out obviously, but uh, do you have any openings for 2023 um, available? We don't for 2023 and we're filling up for 2024 pretty quick. All right. What, what, what are the hunts typically, uh, typically cost for, for a wolf hunt? So we're, we're $5,500 for a six-day hunt. Um, 
and uh, okay. I, I could say that's the price for 2024, but I can't guarantee it for 2025. Um, you know, fuel is outrageous. So <laughs> yeah, you're telling me <laughs> a lot of fuel and costs in wolf hunt. And that's, that's a great value. You get a hunt fuel accommodations, food. I mean, that's, that's a really good value. And, and you get to hang out with me. So <laughs> <laughs> is there a discount when Steve's in camp? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> unfortunately not. I was going to say, so if I come to do a wolf hunt with you and you get to hang out with me, <laughs> then I can charge you 6500 that? I think it's double, How actually. We... I get to charge double. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not Steve. Remember that. <laughs> All right. Guys, thank you for joining us on Wild Talk. Byron, thank you for joining us. Go right here. Book a hunt with Byron. It was an amazing experience. You guys will have a lot of fun. Very good, guys. Thank you. If you've ever wanted to do a wolf hunt in Alberta, Canada, you've ever done any research and ever been on social media looking for wolf information, you'll recognize the name Byron Wolf from Wolf Hunt and Adventures. Byron, welcome to Wild Talk. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. So you've been wolf hunting for how many years now? We did our very first wolf hunt in 2014. Uh, it was kind of a crazy experience uh, how it all happened. Uh, I kind of poached a seat on an airplane and uh, ran into another hunter and he was from Colorado and he wanted to hunt wolves and I wanted to go to Colorado and hunt elk. So we traded hunts. A chance encounter on a flight that you're not supposed to be on has turned into you running one of the largest uh, wolf hunting organizations in Northern Alberta. How do you even go about working out that first hunt? How did that all play out? We had almost a year to, to get ready for it. It was a bunch of learning. And what I, if I look back and see what we did then to what we do now. And wow, I can't believe it actually worked. We did kill wolves on that hunt, but I mean, it, uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't try to operate that way again. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's fast forward to uh, today, Byron, you guys run what? I think it was 40 hunters a year. Yeah, we're we're going to be over 40 hunters this year. Pre-COVID, we were, you know, 35, 36 hunters a year. We we're going to open up two camps. Uh COVID because the the market's there. Of course, COVID shut everything down. Uh we we did try two camps last winter. Um Steve killed two wolves out of our north camp. Um and it was, it was okay, but I didn't like it because I wasn't a part of the North camp. I was at home running this camp, and then I had a couple guides up north. And I didn't like being out of touch with the hunters, so we just put that to bed. And you mentioned the fact that you didn't like not being a part of that North camp. One thing that I, I think is really cool, I've had the pleasure of hunting with your wife, actually, in Argentina with Steve. And Steve's always talked about is the fact that your organization is a fully family-run uh, hunting operation is that correct you guys it's husband and wife children involved and you guys really take like true passion in what you do up there that's that's right yeah no like the the boys they're both in school now they're gone moved out uh but they used to be a lot of help doing baits and all that other stuff and the girls they've always been a part of cooking and helping out and they'll come do baits with me and kathy she's She's everything that you don't see behind the scenes, you know, She and she's not afraid to get in there and run baits and pick up hunters and all that other good stuff too. So, so let's, let's get into the, the crux of, of, of wolf hunting. Um, obviously there's, there's a stigma in general population of, you know, wolves are, shouldn't be hunted and all that fun stuff, but there's, uh, I guess it'd be a delicate balance between, um, predator control and what wolves do to elk and, and ungulate populations. Um, did you want to touch on that a little bit, Byron, and, and give us a little insight on, you know, why we should be wolf hunting, why we should be working to c control the populations of the wolves? 
so not only are the wolves hard on the ungulates when there's an overpopulation, but they also get disease ridden. Um, some of the bigger packs that we we're still hunting them today, but when we started, they were 14 to 18 wolves in a pack. Um, right. And I would say 50% of them we shot had shoulder mites or mange. Now those packs are down around six to eight. Uh, there's no shoulder mite. There's mm -hmm. no mange. Uh, we're not finding dead ones that they've killed because they, they do kill the, the weak and the sick. Um, if you're not, right. uh, if you're not contributing to the pack, they will, they will kill it. So, well, Byron, as a BC resident, I certainly understand the damage that wolves can do to our ungulate populations over here. So it's great to hear that you guys are able to keep them under control or doing your part to keep them under control over in Alberta. Um, you mentioned that you've been battling or not battling, but hunting multiple packs and you've been hunting them for multiple years, the same packs. Have you had to adapt or change your hunt styles with these packs? Have they changed their, their patterns at all? Every pack is different. I've never run into two packs that act the same. That being said, every year is different with the same packs as well. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a pack that I've hunted for six years and I can't find them this year. I know they're around, but I, I haven't had them on bait. We started December 1st and they haven't, they haven't been to a bait they've known about for years. And uh, is it all primarily um, bait hunting that you're doing with them? Do you go out, are you calling them in at all? Or is it strictly over bait? What you guys do up there? We we just do over bait now. The first couple of years we tried the whole calling thing, but our our area is flat, big farm fields or really flat bush country. There's no hills to get above them, get your sight. Um, the other day I had a a pack of nine out on a big lake, and I couldn't get them to come any closer than a thousand yards. They they came probably a mile and a half across the lake, mm -hmm. but they stopped at a thousand yards because they couldn't see what was making the howling noise. And they're just, they're that smart. Interesting. So only, so only a thousand yards. So you really needed Steve Eklund out there with his six, five Creed more because <laughs> you know, he can shoot anything at like 6,000 yards. And he, he, longer, he told right? me he'd come up and do it with a slingshot. So uh, that wouldn't surprise me one little bit. See if he'll wear those hot pants that uh, you found of him in that video. Yeah, we're going to take a quick break here, guys. Uh, we're going to go to commercial, and we'll be back with, uh, with Byron Wolf from Wolf Hunting Adventures. Welcome back to Wild Talk. We are joined still by Byron Wolf from Wolf Hunting Adventures. Uh, just before the break, we were ribbing Steve a little bit um, on some of his outfits through the holidays. But Byron, Steve's actually been up and hunted with you quite a few times, and I've seen some pictures of some pretty big wolves in his hands. Just how big are these wolves that you guys are taking up there? The biggest wolf we've ever killed is 130 pounds, um, and it it was a giant. Steve's, I think Steve's biggest wolf was 117. If that num that number seems to stick in my head, which is that's a hell of a wolf. There is there is no such thing as a two hundred pound wolf, and I've I've told millions of people if you can show me a two hundred pound wolf on a scale, I'll give you a free wolf hunt, and I've never have to get had to give one away yet. So, so what you're trying to tell us is there's no such thing as a hundred and forty pound coyote. <laughs> no, that doesn't exist either. <laughs> uh, funny. So Byron, let's uh, you know well, obviously without giving out too many of your uh, too many of your secrets and your tips, what uh, what are a couple of tips you like to throw out to the viewers to help them if they're going to go on a on a self baited wolf hunt? If you're going to go and do your own wolf hunt, you're going to put in a lot of effort. Don't ex expect to be successful right away. It's going to take time. It may happen the first time you go and sit it. You got really lucky, but. Never sit a bait with the wrong wind because they will not come in. I find mm -hmm. the further away from the bait you are, the better chance you got. My magic number is 250 yards. Um, that's a long shot for a lot of people. We probably average 50% misses at that distance. Um, so know your, wow. know your rifle, know, your, know how to shoot, all that good stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I like... I like a good open area, uh, beaver ponds, 
uh, field edges. Uh, I'll, I'll, I like to put my blind in the field and the bait on the edge or on the edge of a beaver mm-hmm. pond and a, across on the other side the bait. So they got cover coming in. Um, but I find wolves love beaver ponds and little creek drainages and stuff like that. That's very interesting. I've, I've set up um, on wolves. We've been able to uh, have a lot of success getting them relatively close, but they've always seemed to hang up. Uh, like we found fresh kills when I've been out hunting um, or areas where we can see they're cruising the logging roads. We've been able to pull them in close. We can hear them howling, but we're hunting steep timbered area. And we've just never been able to get them to close those that last little bit of a difference and it's distance, I should say. And it just seems like they're very, for how aggressive you think a wolf would be, they're actually very apprehensive as well. They don't like to get too close without getting your wind. You know, uh, if, if they can get in behind you, uh, they'll do it every time. I'm going to assume being the expert, you've got an answer to this one. But, you know, you see the uh, general populace and, and the, the rhetoric that comes out that wolves don't kill indiscriminately and they eat everything that they kill. True or false? They, they are opportunists. They will kill what's in front of them when it's in front of them, given the chance. Now, if they've just devoured a fresh moose and there's another one right in front of them, are they going to chase it down? Probably not. We've all overeaten that Thanksgiving dinner and you got six pounds of turkey and you, you're not going to go for a run but say they're they're chasing a herd of deer and two of them take down one the rest of the pack aren't going to turn around and go back they're going to kill as many of that herd as they can i've seen it in in a night where there's there's three deer killed in in a mile stretch so um, the first two cleaned right up and the, the third one just just barely touched well, Byron, um, it is a hot topic. Some people aren't sure where they sit on wolf hunting, but with the experience you've had in your area, what are some things you can say to those fence sitters that might lean them more towards getting in the field and getting after those wolves? Well, you get a healthier ungulate population and the wolves will be healthier. We touched on that earlier with uh, the mange and the shoulder mites. And you've seen that for yourself personally in the area since you've been hunting? hundred percent, yeah. Well, Byron, thanks for thanks for doing your part of making uh, the herds more healthy and the uh, the packs more healthy as well. So, uh, if anybody wants to go on a wolf hunt with you, now we're getting ready to close out, obviously. But uh, do you have any openings for twenty twenty three available? We don't for twenty twenty three, and we're filling up for twenty twenty four pretty quick. All right. What 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 do the hunts typically uh, typically cost for for a wolf hunt? So we're, we're $5,500 for a six day hunt. Um, and uh, okay. I, I could say that's the price for 2024, but I can't guarantee it for 2025. Um, you know, fuel is outrageous. So <laughs> yeah, you're telling me <laughs> a lot of fuel and costs in wolf hunt. And that's, that's a great value. You get a hunt, fuel, accommodations, food. I mean, that's, that's a really good value. And, and you get to hang out with me. So <laughs> Is there a discount when Steve's in camp? <laughs> no, no, unfortunately not. I was going to say, so if I come to do a wolf hunt with you and you get to hang out with me, <laughs> then I can charge you 6500 I think it's double, actually. I get to charge double. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not Steve. Remember that. <laughs> All right. Guys, thank you for joining us on Wild Talk. Byron, thank you for joining us. Go right here. Book a hunt with Byron. It was an amazing experience. You guys will have a lot of fun. Very good, guys. Thank you. I'm Mike Bichand, and today we're going to talk about predator hunting tips and tricks. We're going to focus on locations. So, location is obviously where you want to go hunt coyotes. Just thinking an area might hold coyotes is not necessarily good enough. Go out and scout. Scout your private permissions. Scout crown land. Make note of where you saw coyotes during hunting season or during any time of the year. Uh, When you're out, look for fresh signs, so scat, kills. Look for tracks that are heading from dens to bedding or to hunting areas. Make note of all those things. Those will make a huge difference 
when you actually get out there and are after them and you'll have a more success calling them in because you've already located where they are. So one thing you want to look for when you're goat cloud hunting is you want to scout properties and find fresh signs like you would for whitetails, same thing for coyotes. So fresh sign, coyote scan. So probably from last night, doubt it's from this morning, it's cold, but here's fresh sign right there. At least you know you're on the right track. Instead of find a nice place to call, get to calling. Mature coyotes are very similar to mature whitetails. They're wise, they're experienced, they're a lot harder to kill. Using a call is enough to bring in an immature coyote, but if you want to take down a mature one, you need to take out two of its three senses. Those are sight, sound, and smell. The call obviously eliminates the sound sense, but a decoy is going to take away that sight sense. Decoys will distract their attention, allowing you to be able to do whatever you need to do and having them rush that, that decoy and that call. Obviously a motion decoy is a lot better than say a static one, but anything is better than nothing. So always be ready to shoot before you start running any sort of call. As well, position your caller 50 yards up or crosswind of your position. Do not set it up directly in front of you so that you are, it is in between you and their sight path. It's a good way to get busted. As well, consider having it set up so that they don't cross your scent path as it it's, it's coming. Like you don't want them running towards that collar and hitting your scent trail because they're obviously going to bust, right? So you kind of give them that wind advantage, but have the collar set up so that they're going to hit the collar before they hit you. Okay, so we're setting up uh, the electronic call with an external speaker and a motion decoy that's already pre-attached to it. Shoot down to that far tree line and then call one into here. I'm going to be set up right there. A lot of these calls, including mine, come with either an attachment to it or they come with a motion decoy. And what I'll do is I'll run the call without the decoy to start with and when I see them approach, I'll flip the decoy on and thumbs, the ones that hang up, that'll only be enough to draw them towards that. So, okay. We're going to go pull the toboggan over to my spot and we'll get set up for calling. When you get set up and you start running your calls, don't start running it on max volume. A lot of times you're gonna trigger that fight or flight response and more likely you're gonna get that flight response and they're gonna take off because all of a sudden out of nowhere they're getting this extremely loud. You wouldn't do that necessarily calling elk and you wouldn't do it calling whitetails. You're gonna use soft calls to start with in case there's anything close and then you'll go loud, right? And same thing with coyotes. Start off quietly, up the volume with your hand calls or your e-caller. So, you're calling, it's worked. You got coyotes coming in. If it's one, amazing. If it's two, even better. But they are coming. All right, so you're coming in, draw them in close. Give yourself that highest percentage shot. Don't just start throwing lead just because they're a couple hundred yards out. Get them within that hundred yards. Get them in where you're gonna make sure that you put them down uh, ethically. able to call in a coyote with a uh, cage cottontail, um, pulled it from a big wood pile a couple hundred yards away. Uh, I was I had the collar set up behind me, and you'll, you'll hear it in the Tacticam, I'm hoping. The collar's behind me, I'm sitting in a wood pile, um, and it's coming at me, it's she, she's coming right at me. Uh, I was going to shoot her with a rifle, but I realized how close she was getting. So I put the rifle down, picked up a shotgun, and uh, put her down. I think I missed the first shell, um, but she made a hard left my direction, which was a bad choice, and I was able to hit her with the next two, put her down pretty quick. So we have a success, at least one dog down. Uh, color of stands, obviously, were a bust. Fortunately, again, that happens. I hope the tips work for you. Um, does they have work for me? tactics I use and uh, good luck out there.
Welcome back to Wild Talk. Now we have the host, the man, the myth, the legend, Wes David from Fishing the Wild West TV show. Wes, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Scott, for having me. So you have been in the television industry for how many years? Um, we are about to shoot our eighth season. Uh, prior to, before we shot, like my rookie year, you know, we were learning it. I, ha I bought some cameras and just, you know, kind of learn how to do it. As you know, there's a lot of tricks that you, behind the scenes that people don't realize to shooting a show. Even, even the YouTubers, you know, they, they, there's things they learn the hard way often. So started about two years before that. And then before we really got into, to go into TV. Do you still compete in uh, walleye tournaments? No, um, due to the show, uh, time-wise, uh, the time is just not there. Um, you may think, you know, being the host and producer of a fishing show, I get to come and go where I want, and that's not the case. Um, and when I am not on the road or on the water shooting the show, you're, I'm doing stuff for magazines or conservation. When I'm not doing that stuff, I still have to be a husband and a father. So I, I try to, as I get older, I try to spend as much time at home as I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can, I can certainly relate to that. You know, when, when we started with Wild back in the day, we thought that we were going to be able to hunt all the time. Not so much. <laughs> no, and that's the thing. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I wish I, I did what you do for a living. And um, as much as I love producing the show, uh, it's, it's a lot of, it's a job. It's, there's, like any other job, there's highs and lows. There's some extreme yeah. highs and lows. Um, there's times I want to be anywhere but there. But I can promise you this. <laughs> I'm a heavy duty mechanic by trade and getting up at four in the morning to go fishing is a lot easier than getting up and running a service truck. I can promise you that, especially when it's 20 below. <laughs> I can relate, trust me. <laughs> so you, uh, let's, let's talk about a little bit about Wes David. So you grew up in Bicycler, is that right? Yeah, family farm, grew up on a cattle ranch uh, in Bicycler, Alberta, um, 40 minutes northeast of Calgary. Um, grew up there. My uh, dad, my aunt, or my uncles, Roy and Ron David, they were part of the chuck wagons. Uh, my dad was a calf roper. My mom was a barrel racer. So it didn't take me long to, oh, I was introduced to the rodeo world at a young age. Um, and as young as I can remember, like five, six years old, you know, we were riding calves or, you know, riding horse, whatever. And it graduated, I went to steer riding um graduated to junior bull riding then to bull riding and fortunate to say that's all i did for a living till i was about 25 26 years old from 18 to 25 or 26. now when i say a living i wasn't starving but i wasn't getting fat either <laughs> I, was just, <laughs> I was just just getting by so it was um but it, it rodeo taught me so much in life uh, so much that i didn't realize I was even learning like business wise and, and just to you know deal with people and be on the road and that sort of thing. And it was the biggest, that's the biggest reason why I got into tournament fishing. When I was done rodeoing, I missed the camaraderie of, ro actually I missed rodeo. I thought I missed, you know, the thrill of competition. So I started, I always loved fishing. So I started going to, to walleye tournament to see, see, you know, where I measured up. But what I found was I missed the camaraderie of rodeo, and I found that in the tournament world. Um, okay. Lots of friendly people there. You know, you, you fish all day and then, you know, have a beer in the evening. If someone's struggling, they may not give up their hot spot or their top secret, but they would definitely help you out. And it was, it was a really great community to be a part of. And then yeah. once you got your, your feet wet in the show, you said, okay, no more... No, no time to go do the walleye tour, and here we are today. So, <laughs> yeah, and that's but, right. And here I'm talking to you today. <laughs> so let's let's talk about ice fishing, the hard water. It's uh, that time of year now. I'm actually going to be heading out uh, this weekend for Saturday and Sunday. What um, I don't know where where do we want to start? I think let's start with uh, your favorite your favorite time of year. My absolute favorite time 
for ice fishing is March. And I mean, it's referred to across the prairie provinces of, as March Madness. It's just, I don't know what it is. March Madness is truly a thing. You know, it turns, the fish turn on. I think they're longer days, you know, a little more light penetration through the, through the ice. They're, they're anticipating the spawn. Um, and it's just a great time to be on the water, especially for perch, walleye, and northern pike. Okay, and now there's also a, uh, a disease that comes right around the end of March, right? Yeah, you'll, uh, a lot of uh, employees will notice their, uh, or employers will notice their employees get, you know, get a day or two flu. <laughs> and it's really bad that they can't come into work because <laughs> they're out ice fishing, mm -hmm. especially yeah, last okay. week of March. We're going to jump to commercial, uh, Wes, here, so we'll see you folks when we come back uh, after this short commercial break. Welcome back to Wild Talk. We're here with Wes David, and he's about to spill every single tip and trick that he's learned over his many, many years on this planet on fishing the hard water for perch, pike, and walleyes. So, Wes, I mentioned earlier we're going out uh, this weekend. We're going to be going after perch and pike. Top three tips for each. Go. Top three tips. Uh, be patient. Uh, is the, is the be <laughs> biggest thing because it's not going to happen. We all go open water fishing, and you can you can find the fish, but mm -hmm. be patient. Right now, uh, end of March or mid, like any time in March, for pike and walleye, I like about twelve to eight feet of water. Um, kind of any areas, especially in the the lakes and reservoirs where they're funneling to the back bays. You know, you mm -hmm. kind of get that bottleneck. Um, mm -hmm. Pike and walleye will be moving in and out of there. Um, most of the Prairie Province lakes, you know, where there's walleye, there's pike that, you know, they coexist together. Um, so you can get a mixed bag of both species. I like the AquaView cameras because I can put it down. I can see one, I can see if the fish are there or coming through at the very least coming through. But also it's taught me a great deal through the ice or open water is I can see what the fish are doing, how they're reacting to my lure. You know, do they want it, mm -hmm. if I'm twitching it and they back away or maybe they move on it. So it'll help you, help educate you on what the fish actually want that day. And actually it may change from half hour to half hour. You know, they might want it really slow, really fast, who knows what. Under a tip up, um, it, it's common knowledge, but it's still missed a lot. You take uh, your herring or your minnows. I like to hook them upside down, so so the hooks upside the down. Yep, and they're they're hanging like this, because when a fish is mm -hmm. in there, when they're struggling, you know they're struggling or whatever. But when they die, they they usually go sideways or upside down and come to the surface. So if those okay. fish are hanging <laughs> upside down, they know it's a fish in distress or dead. It's an easy meal. That's my. My three tip, my locations and how I hook my bait. And as I was telling you, Steve or uh, Scott, off camera, by the three rocks near the Black Angus cows, that's where the fish will be every time. Well, I know exactly where that is, so that's where I'm going tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you even brought props with you. That's awesome. How about uh, how about uh, how about the perch? That, you're the northern. The northern lakes have some of the best perch. Southern Alberta reservoirs have some great perch fishing. Um, and the easiest thing I can say is perch will be where perch are at. I found them in 40 feet of water at this time of the year, and I found them in seven feet of water. Um, and your predator fish, like the pike and walleye, they'll often tell you where they are because they'll move in to feed on the perch. But that's a tough one. Perch are where perch are. Yeah, I've, I, I drill many, many holes to find them when I head out. <laughs> Sometimes I get lucky on the first one, but that doesn't happen most of the time. So I get lucky on the first one usually because I have a great editor. 
Right, the magic of television. <laughs> he had to go the other 30 holes that I've drilled. <laughs> yeah, on battery number eight with my electric <laughs> auger. Uh, yeah. But I found him on the first try. So we're, 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 getting, down to, uh, we're getting down to time, Wes. So thank you so much for, for the tips. I, I want to talk a little bit about what you do for conservation because I know this is a huge part of your life. Um, a huge part of your family's life too. Can you tell us, you know, just a few things that you that you do? Um, on top of that, I, I know you write uh, articles for magazines uh, along with the show, of course. Uh, that you have some great tips and great information in. Where can people find the articles as well? Um, yeah, I write for several different magazines. At one point, I was writing for like thirty different magazines, but now it's down to about eight or ten, just due to time. Hook Magazine is one of my favorite magazines that cover fishing right across Western Canada. Um, I write for the popular Alberta Outdoorsman um, and several out of the U.S. Uh, uh, as far as conservation, conservation has always been important to me because I truly believe this, and I've said it on the show over and over, farmers, or hunters, anglers, farmers, and ranchers are some of the best, if not the best, conservation-minded people out there. They take care of the animal. You want to know farmers? You want to know where deer are on a farmer's land? Ask him. He'll tell you where they are almost to the minute. And I truly believe it is hunters and anglers that that are some of the best and that need to give back. And I, it's never been more important right now than to get our youth involved in our hunting and fishing heritage. Are any of our viewers going to be able to find you out on uh, the hard water at any ice fishing tournaments or events here this year? Uh, no tourist events. We'll be filming in Saskatchewan here in a week. Um, and what, as I get a little older, it's, I'm a fair weather ice fisherman. If it's 40 below, I don't even answer the door. <laughs> but um, if, if you do see me out there, by all means, uh, come and say hi. Um, you see us at the boat launches this summer. Come and say hi. Fish in the Wild West TV wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the viewers. Awesome. Well, Wes, thank you so much for joining us. And as always, I appreciate you and we we'll look forward to seeing you out on the water. No, oh, thank you for having me on the show. Greatly appreciate it. And for our next guest, with some really exciting news, we have Rod Giltaka, CEO and Executive Director of the CCFR, joining us once again. Rod, it is always a pleasure having you on the show, especially when there is some positive news to be shared. Um, as everybody is aware, recently uh, two amendments to C21 have been withdrawn. That is a huge victory for legal can Canadian gun owners. Um, but how did this victory come about and what does this really mean for Canadian gun owners? Well, thanks for having me, Joe. It's good to see you. Um, so there were two nasty amendments, which I think uh, a lot of people have heard about. It was G4 and G46 and those amendments together. One of them banned basically all semi-automatic uh, rifles and shotguns in Canada. And the other one um, had, <laughs> it was like hundreds of pages long um, of basically prohibiting firearms by name. By, by characteristic in some of them and by name in others. So those, uh, those amendments were withdrawn by the Liberals. Uh, it was their amendment to Bill C-21. And, the, and if, you, if you remember a couple of months ago, they were all in. They were like, we're doing this. This is, you know, this is, this is we were mandated by Canadians to do this. Of course, they really weren't. But, uh, but anyway, what made the difference? What made this all happen um, was each individual firearm owner deciding, yeah, you know what? I have a dog in the fight. I'm willing to spend 20 minutes to write a couple of letters, throw them in the mailbox. They, they, they don't, I, you don't even have to pay for postage if you're sending them to Parliament Hill to the MP's offices. Uh, taking 20 minutes to call their MP, leaving a message for them, sending them an email. Like small things, but a lot of people did it. So organizations like the CCFR and Wildlife Federations and all the rest provide some organizing influence. But at the end of the day, we're, we're meaningless if we don't have 50, 100,000, 200,000 people standing behind us doing 
just small things. So this victory belongs to every gun owner that took 20 minutes, took an hour, took two hours to do something about it. And I couldn't be more proud of our community. That, that honestly just gave me goosebumps. Just thinking, um, you know, how many battles gun owners and us as hunters and everybody are constantly up against. Um, and sometimes it's difficult getting everybody on the same page. And I think it's due to the efforts of yourself and, you know, the CCFR getting everybody rallied together. But it is just so exciting to hear that our voice is being heard because sometimes um, I'm sure everybody feels it. We speak up, we speak out, and we aren't heard or we aren't listened to. So it's we are gaining traction. Um, but as you've mentioned, the battle is far from over. I mean, how many amendments are still coming down the pipe at us right now? So we, def I guess as a, as a community, we defeated two amendments, and there's 93 more coming. So uh, when it comes to those amendments, uh, we don't know what they are yet. So right. when, uh, when uh, parties submit these amendments to a bill, they are secret. They they enjoy parliamentary privilege or whatever they call it. I think it's confidentiality. But um, but anyway, they sit there on the books. The committee members know what, what's in them because they've read them, but they can't be released to the public until they're read into the record in the Public Safety Committee. So that committee, we keep an eye. We're, we are present at every single meeting. We mm -hmm. record that meeting and upload it to our YouTube channel. So we, we capture all that stuff. So as these amendments come out, We'll know exactly what's happening, and then we'll we'll come up with a, a plan uh, to, to fight it if it's a bad amendment. So it's not over by a long shot. No, 93 is not a small number. A big victory for two. Um, as you mentioned, these were two very egregious amendments, but uh, 93, I'm sure there will still be some whoppers coming our way. Is there a timeline, a structured timeline for when they will be released? Or without knowing a timeline, what can we be doing in the interim to make sure that we're still putting our best foot forward and representing ourselves in the best way possible. Well, like I said, the, the key to all this is a large group of people doing just a little bit, not a small group of people doing everything, but just, just participate because I can't emphasize enough that, you know, we could have been working 24 seven, been making all this noise. Same thing with wildlife federations and other organizations we are meaningless without gun owners participating a little bit. So if you're interested, you can go to scrapc21.ca. we got a bunch of tools there, scrapc21.ca. Um, there's tools to help you write a, a short letter, and it only has to be a couple of sentences to your MP. You can send it postage-free to their Parliament Hill office. Uh, you can call your MP. We have tools to locate your MP there <laughs> with a couple of clicks to get their contact information. It's really important. And also, there's a link there to see your MP's voting record. And that's really important, too, because always deal with what they do. Forget about what they say because it's meaningless. Look at what they do. So, Well, that's great that you guys have laid it out and made it so easy. And I think the big takeaway is it is a large volume of individuals banding together and doing a little bit of effort. It's not counting on everybody to drop everything and you know devote all of their effort. It's very attainable. Everybody can get involved because of these um, you know, websites and these resources that you've made available to everybody. Okay, Rod, we're getting down to the wire here. Are there any closing remarks or last little bits of information you would like our viewers to know? Well, definitely, uh, as, I, as I've said before, go to scrapc21.ca. There's all kinds of tools there. And, and again, it's just we, we will enjoy this small little victory because you got to enjoy them when you have them. Um, but we need to keep working. So go to the website. There's plenty of uh, small, easy things that you can do. And to, together, that makes a, a huge difference. So I appreciate the opportunity. Rod, always a pleasure having you on. We will put some of that information right here on the screen so our viewers can go on and access those resources. Again, Rod, CEO and Executive Director of the CCFR, always heading this battle with all of our favors and rights. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us here tonight, Rod. Thanks, Joe. Well, there you have it, Scott, right from Rod Giltaka. I mean, this was a big victory for legal Canadian gun owners here, but the battle is far from over with over 90 amendments still coming down the pipe at us for review. Yeah. Um, you know, again, we have to take this momentum and we have to run with it. No, that's right, Joe. It's <laughs> the fight is far from over. And the CCFR has been doing some amazing things in the background. 
you guys got to check out ccfrdownload.ca. There are a ton of memes, videos, things you can sh share on social media, um, templates for letters. Guys, we got to keep the pressure on. We've got to make sure that we're contacting our MPs because this is just the beginning. Like Joe said, with over 90 amendments that are still yet to be reviewed for C21, yeah, this is long from over. And uh, so, again, Rod, thank you for joining us. Um, Byron, great tips on uh, wolf hunting. Thank you. Uh, if Byron can make Steve Eklund uh, successful, then he can make anybody successful. Make sure you book a, a wolf hunt with him. Yes, it is always a pleasure catching up with Byron Wolf. And then also Mike Bashan with some of those very useful uh, hunting tips. And speaking of tips, Scott, you might have a chance of finally landing some fish this winter, thanks to Wes David and some of those, you know, tips and tricks he lent you there. I know. I'm I'm really hoping. I, actually, I'm really hoping that I can get Wes to come out fishing with me. He can catch the fish, and then I'll just reel them in and pretend I caught them. Just take the pictures. All you need is a picture at the end, right? Yeah, but it gives me something to do, right? <laughs> That'll be perfect. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Wild Talk. I'm Scott Sterling with my co-host, Joe Appel. We'll see you next time on Wild Talk. Wild Talk is brought to you by Trapper Gores. The Wild TV Canada app. And Bronk Beer.